Assassin's Creed has made substantial changes to its gameplay since the first game parkoured into our lives some 13 years ago. So with the reveal of the latest title, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, let's take a look at how the series has evolved and the big additions each mainline entry has brought to the table. Sorry, handhelds. Let's take it back to where it all began, 2007's Assassin's Creed, which had three core pillars, social stealth, platforming, and combat. And obviously assassinating targets, but I'd argue that that falls under all of the above. Back then, stealth played a huge role in the game, and they really leaned into you being a knife, or should I say, hidden blade in the dark. You could sneak around, blending in with crowds to lose heat, and enemies had an awareness indicator. You also had a rudimentary version of Eagle Vision that helped you locate targets and hiding spots. Unfortunately, it also limited your movement, which was not ideal when another core part of the game was its movement. AC took us out into an open world and let us free run all over it, scaling towers, synchronizing viewpoints, and of course, leaping into hay bales to get back down again. Assassin's Creed referred to its stealth as low-profile actions, and there was a designated button to make you go high-profile. These high-profile activities included its beloved parkour, as well as open combat. Admittedly, enemies would usually only attack you one at a time, so it wasn't ever really that difficult. Assassin's Creed laid a strong foundation, and its sequel built on it with a load of new additional systems like economics. You could invest money in renovating your villa, which would then grant you income as well as discounts in shops. This feature would then be expanded into city-wide renovation in later games. Stealth changed too, and there were now multiple new ways to take out enemies, like using smoke bombs to clear line of sight, or hiring bands of thieves or courtesans to blend in with. There was also a new notoriety system, take too much heat and your face would be recognizable. You'd have to tear down posters or bribe heralds, otherwise guards would recognize you and attack on sight. You could now use eagle vision while moving, which was genuinely huge. Combat changed too, with new enemy types and moves, as well as new weapons and upgrades made available through the lovable Leonardo da Vinci, who also provided you with a flying machine, because of course he did. Parkour didn't change that much, but you could leap while climbing now to get some extra momentum, and Ezio could even swim. These parkour abilities would come into their own during the Assassin Tomb segments, Parkour puzzles that would reward Ezio with Altair's armor set if they were all completed. Brotherhood added a slew of smaller things, like dual wielding, more weapon options including heavy weapons, ranged combat options, and a horse you could call at any time, but its two major contributions were apprentices and multiplayer. You could recruit NPCs to your cause and level them up by giving them contracts, and even call on them in battle. But multiplayer was the biggest addition. You'd spend matches trying to identify other real players hiding among the many NPCs, while simultaneously trying to remain unnoticed to take out your enemies quickly and quietly. Super intense, but a whole lot of fun, and something that was genuinely really different. While multiplayer would stick around in the series for a while, the tower defense sequences from Revelations would not. It was a minigame added to ensure that you kept the city of Constantinople under assassin rule by fighting off waves of Templars, but it felt very out of place in an Assassin's Creed game. A new addition to parkour was the hook blade, which made zipping around the city a breeze and acted like a frontrunner of sorts for the rope launcher that we would use in Syndicate. Revelations was big on bomb crafting, which was fine if a little unnecessary. The game's core combat still wasn't very difficult with your expanded armory, and the fact that you could chain kills easily meant that it was never ever really that challenging. With the Ezio trilogy over, it was time to go to the frontier, as well as cities Boston and New York. Parkouring became easier as the control scheme changed, and the new assassin Connor could clamber up and down and between trees as well as around rooftops with ease. Combat had a huge overhaul, feeling more like Batman Arkham's countering with context-specific actions like using an enemy as a shield. It still never became that challenging though, especially as the game removed healing items and let Connor's health just regenerate outside of combat instead. A new co-op mode, called Wolfpack, was added, which saw up to four players group up to assassinate NPCs. Weather impacted your movement and visibility, and there was hunting now too. 3 was also the first to feature naval combat. Connor had his own warship, and you could fire cannons and board enemy ships. However, this only really took place during side missions, but in the next game we'd be spending a whole lot more time at sea. Speaking of spending time at sea, you'd spend about 40% of Black Flag at sea. 
Like in three side missions, you take on other ships, firing your cannons and ramming enemy vessels, but you could also scout ships ahead of time with your trusty spyglass to see what booty was on offer. In an evolution of recruiting apprentices, you could board ships and recruit the defeated enemies to your crew. Naturally, for a game about pirates, there was a lot of sunken treasure that you could die for. And I'll go on record here, the underwater levels were actually decent. You could also free aim with your pistols, making long range weapons way more viable. We haven't talked about playing as Desmond, the hapless bartender at the heart of the modern day segments, but that's because he didn't really do that much. In Black Flag though, we stopped playing as him completely, instead switching to a first person perspective of a newbie at Abstergo Industries. Poor Rogue got a bit left behind, releasing at the same time as Assassin's Creed Unity, but only for previous gen consoles while Unity got to be on the new shiny next gen, for better or for worse. Rogue had naval combat, but you can now ram icebergs in the North Atlantic and release oil slicks and set them on fire. Enemies could now also board your ship. And as a Templar, protagonist Shay had different weapons, including an air rifle, which also had a grenade launcher attachment for some reason. It also had way more environmental hazards like gas barrels that could send you berserk, unless you managed to put on a mask in time. The AC game worlds had been getting bigger and bigger, but I don't think anyone was ready for a one-to-one -one rendering of some of Paris' landmarks like Notre Dame. In order to clamber around these landmarks more efficiently, the free-running controls changed again, this time with a specific button to allow you to climb up and another to climb down, although it wasn't really that popular among fans. They did introduce skill trees to the franchise and tried something cool with assassinations, calling them black box missions. Basically, the game would show you your target and it'd be up to you to choose how you'd get the kill, making you feel more like an actual assassin adapting to the situation rather than you just following a bunch of prompts. Building on from Wolfpack mode, it also introduced co-op for up to four players in campaign missions, but lost the competitive multiplayer entirely. Syndicate gave us not one, but two assassins to play as, each with their own distinct style, the brawler Jacob and the stealthier Evie. London was even bigger than Paris, and so to get around easier, the twins had a rope launcher at their disposal to help them zip about, but with the side effect that it took any kind of challenge or deliberateness out of the parkour. The London boroughs under Templar control needed to be liberated by first undermining the rulers by undertaking various activities. When they were sufficiently weakened, you could initiate a full-on gang war and claim the turf for your own. They also dropped the co-op for Syndicate, taking Assassin's Creed back to its fully single-player roots. Assassin's Creed Origins was massive. To help navigate it a little easier, the game ditched the mini-map, instead opting for a compass bar on screen. Eagle Vision turned into a literal eagle, with Senu, who you could use to scout out and mark enemies. Through the game's extensive skill tree, you could even upgrade her to attack enemies for you. Senu obviously can't go inside, so it introduced a pulse type thing to help you scan for items indoors. And the skill tree wasn't the only RPG mechanic that was added, there was a full crafting system in place too. Combat changed to be a hitbox based system, and as many at the time pointed out, it played a little bit like Dark Souls, especially because Bayek had a ruddy shield. Bayek could build up energy in his adrenaline gauge and unleash a furious finisher, or enter a state where he's faster and stronger which was useful because there were more intricate boss fights against mythical, godlike creatures. There wasn't any sort of traditional multiplayer or co-op in Origins, but there was some online interactivity. You could see pictures that other players had taken, or find the body of others and take on revenge missions. If Origins was dipping the franchise's toes into RPG territory, Odyssey was the cannonball into the pool. You could choose between two protagonists, Alexios and Cassandra, there was decision making, branching quest lines, romance options, multiple endings, skill trees, the lot. But perhaps the biggest addition was a Shadow of Mordor-esque nemesis system, where if you started to gain notoriety, mercenaries would track you down and try and take you out. Each merc had their own backstory, strengths and weaknesses, and by taking them out you'd gain notoriety and rise through the ranks, which would offer you bonuses in the rest of the world like increased rewards or shop discounts. And if you felt like Odyssey had a little too much going on on screen, and you were just following a dotted line from one mission to the next, its exploration mode stripped all that out, forcing you to actually talk to your NPCs and learn about your surroundings to figure out where to go next. And now we're at the Viking Age with AC Valhalla. There's a couple of things we can glean from the reveal CGI trailer, such as the Raven, which will likely be our eagle vision eye in the sky. The Hidden Blade of course makes a dramatic appearance, 
and given that the Vikings were known for their longships, we can pretty much guarantee a return to sea. Players take control of Ivor, a Viking raider turned leader that's trying to find a new home for his people in England. As part of that, we'll be able to conduct raids, grow settlements, and build power and influence to earn a place among the gods. How does that shake out in gameplay? Well, we're not quite sure yet, but we'll have more in the coming weeks about Valhalla, so keep it GameSpot.